So I, uh, I first stalked on Arata um, at the, the Oakland Food Justice um, Council in 2012. And I remember thinking, wow, this is someone who really understands these ethos of, of food sovereignty and is putting it into this national and international realm. Um, and so yeah, I've, I've covered her work since then. And we're very lucky to have her here tonight. Um, Anurada is the uh, executive director of the Oakland Institute, which is a progressive think tank in Oakland, founded in 2004. And she is the recipient of many awards, too many to mention, um, but the Nation Magazine awarded her as most valuable thinker recently. And um, I think it's important uh, to mention that um, a lot of the work that I think is so needed in unveiling the, the corruption um, and looking into the, the formation of land grabbing uh, is, so, is so crucial at this time. And this is, uh, this is a lot of the, the findings have been made in part by her work at the Oakland Institute. Um, the dynamic relationship between research, advocacy, and international media coverage um, has resulted in a string of successes. Um, it, there is, Adorada is responsible for numerous books and has been acknowledged and interviewed by uh, a very long list of, of news stations, CNN, BBC, BBC World, CBC, ABC, Al Jazeera, National Public Radio, Voice of America. So the list goes on. And um, I, heard, uh, I heard once that, you, uh, that uh, you say you didn't like to be acknowledged as fierce, but um, because you feel that it doesn't acknowledge that there is, um, that you do get afraid. And uh, in the work that you do, I think that that kind of bravery in acknowledging that fear and facing it is so, is so important. So thank you for your bravery. Thank you for being here. And we're so lucky to have you. Thank you, Leah. Um, thank you all for being here. First of all, thank you, Miguel, and everyone who's made this uh, conference possible, the possibility for all of us to come together. Uh, before starting, I would like to take a moment to reflect on the stewards of the land, small family farmers, pastoralists, fisher folk, the indigenous, who are facing the largest threats from climate change and the greed of corporations. Economic policies of rich nations, military interventions in the name of security, policies that are displacing the poor from their homes and land, forcing them to flee their homelands because of economic warfare and political warfare only to be criminalized when they reach the borders of the United States and Europe. Most of us here are immigrants. So I hope one of the things that will happen over the course of the weekend to, is to send out a clear call. We embrace all immigrants. We stand with the dreamers. We welcome all refugees, and we will not allow any walls. This is very important. because it is that oil, we know what it did to Iraq, we know what goes on in the Middle East, we know what is happening across the borders, and it is time to unite our struggles that we shall not be divided. Our agenda is the same, a beautiful earth for our children. It was 10 years ago, 2007 high food price crisis, when it uh, devastated the poor in the poorest countries, pushing the number of hungry people over a billion, one-sixth of humanity was pushed into hunger. People who live on one dollar or two dollars a day were forced to spend over 70 percent of their budgets on food, leaving almost nothing for education, health care, or any kind of social well-being. 
In response to that high food price uh, crisis, the G8, the rich nations, got together at the Lakela summit in 2009, and surprisingly, they made a $20 billion commitment to support country-owned food security strategy, country-owned. However, since then, as it is to be expected, the rich nations have made an unprecedented move to favor corporate takeover of agriculture and build corporate industrial food systems in the developing world through the aid programs. 2012 G8 initiative, New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, was launched in partnership not with the farmers of developing countries or African farmers, but it was launched in partnership with agribusinesses, which was aimed at the corporate takeover of African agriculture. And once again, this agenda comes with the aid conditionality. Now, in order to receive any kind of aid through this alliance, African countries have to commit to reforms to facilitate business in agriculture. So global reforms are happening and they're being guided by a business ranking, the task for which has been handed over, guess yet once again, to the World Bank. These rankings are called EBA, enabling the business of agriculture. Agriculture, which was about feeding communities, nourishing our bodies, uh, stewards of the land, protecting our planet and biodiversity, suddenly it is a business of agriculture. And it was launched in 2013 and is financed by the United States, UK, Dutch, Danish governments, and of course the Gates Foundation. Eight programs of these donors, eight funded grants, they are through insurance mechanisms. They're using taxpayers' money to basically subsidize agribusiness in, on the African continent. Promotion of hybrid seeds, GMOs, pesticides, synthetic fertilizers by aid programs is turning Africa into the new market for a handful of these agrochemical corporations who control our seed supply today. It is basically replacing family farmers with plantations, forcibly displacing indigenous communities from their lands that they've had forever, for centuries, and displacing communities. So EBA, enabling the business of agriculture, is the latest tool to push industrial seeds, and that is just to benefit a handful of agrochemical corporations. Now, further market expansion of these companies depends on shrinking of farmer-managed seed systems, which currently provides 80 to 90 percent of seed supply in the developing world through uh, farm seed saving, through exchanges of seeds and farmer-to-farmer -farmer programs. Now, EBA, how does it really work? It scores you. It ranks you. It's like a report card on each country. So what does it rank you on? on promoting policies that would promote food sovereignty? Is it a scoring which ensures that women have land titles? Uh, is it a scoring which ensures that uh, the poor are fed first or they are floor prices for farmers? No. It gives better ranking to those countries that will ease private companies and not the farmers access to gene banks. Think of intellectual property rights, but it gives you a better ranking if you're going to allow private companies to access your gene banks. It recommends governments to reduce the time and the cost necessary to register industrial seeds. Every country will have a national committee that oversees the introduction of new seeds, and it wants private sector to have the most seats on that committee. So when you start doing things like this, you get a better ranking, which therefore allows you for aid programs. So let me give you an example. In 2016, World Bank upheld Tanzania, a model country, for enacting intellectual property rights law in agriculture. Why? Because it is the first least developed country, I mean, I'm using the language of the bank, least developed country, uh, bound by the 1991 uh, UPOV convention that dramatically restricts farmers' rights to seeds, to save, to protect them, to exchange them. Now, farmers in Tanzania risk fines, and not just fines, but even arrest, if they are caught practicing ancestral seed saving and trading, and they're forced to rely on industrial seeds. Tanzania is also one of the countries that has been upheld because it is allowing foreign investors, so-called foreign investors, to come in and promote development through investing in agriculture. At the Institute, we have looked at a number of these land deals. Let me give you an example of one of them. 
uh, Bruce Rastetter, who's a Republican kingmaker from Iowa and was and still is one of the regents of Iowa State University, um, managed to get a sweetheart land deal with the Prime Minister of Tanzania. So through a company called AgriSoul, he got the largest land deal in Tanzania, 800,000 acres of land for which he was going to pay less than 40 cents per acre of land. So you would pay more for a cup of Starbucks coffee than what he was paying for an acre of land in Tanzania. Um, not just that, this was a 99-year lease. When I met with Bruce Rastetter, um, he claimed that nobody lives on this land. Our research showed that over 160,000 people lived on that land. They were all small farmers who were being forcibly removed. They had come to Tanzania from Burundi almost 45 years ago. They spoke Swahili. They were more Tanzanian that they could, uh, they didn't know what Burundi was, but they didn't have papers. And they were told that if they destroyed their homes, they destroyed the largest church that there is in anywhere in East Africa, they would be given papers for the first time and told where to go. When we exposed the land deal, actually when I met him, I was asking Bruce Rastetter, why would the Tanzanian government do this? Uh, the government was going to take a World Bank loan to put in the railway lines from the farms to the port because he was going to grow GMO corn for ethanol. He used to have the third largest ethanol plant in the United States. Um, so no infrastructure development was happening. The country was taking a World Bank loan. Uh, they were also going to change the environmental laws to allow the you know, growing of GMO corn. So I asked him, why was the Tanzanian government doing all this? Had he promised a lot of jobs? And I'll never forget, you know, he has this very deep blue eyes, and he looked at me with this condescending look, like, you know, five feet two Indian woman asking me a ridiculously stupid question. And he says, you know, the Tanzanian government is really reasonable. They know that we need talent, so we'll be hiring South Africans. And he paused and then said, white South Africans. When we exposed that land deal, he was planning to break ground. That was actually November 2011. It was beautiful. The students of Iowa State University mobilized against one of their own regions. They mobilized to the extent that they asked that this man should be asked to leave this university. They mobilized together with the people in Tanzania, these former refugees who were being forced out of their homes so they could get their papers. And the end result is that even today, Agrisol has not broken ground in Tanzania. And, and the thing that puts a smile on my face is the people are still there and they got their Tanzanian citizenship. They are smallholder farmers growing food that nourishes the communities, not just the area where these former Burundi refugees live, but also the other Tanzanian villages. But Tanzania is not alone. And it is upheld as, you know, as the model of the way to do agricultural development. Let me give you another example. <clears throat> Agrika rice plantation is in Kilimbero Valley of Tanzania. It has been upheld at the Davos World Economic Forum, the way to invest in agriculture. DFID, NORAD, everyone's put money in this scheme. And they say it's a wonderful way to actually, because it has an outgrower scheme. Now, when we looked at this amazing model of investment, of agricultural investment, this is what we found. The outgrower scheme meant that the farmers had to take a loan, and then Agrika got to tell them how that loan should be used, what chemical pesticides, what all will be used for growing the rice, for which they dictated the price. So basically, small family farmers had suddenly been turned into plantation workers at best taking away the sovereignty, the ability to decide what they grow, how they grow, and what the impact is on the environment. When we exposed that, it was a little bit more interesting because suddenly Agrika was like, you wouldn't believe us. You know, these Africans just want money and they'll just lie about us. 
This was the rhetoric of development which they were trying to shove down our throats because we are really good because UK is DFID, which is the aid agency, NORAD, Norway, you know, we think Norwegian's always a lot better in terms of how they do development. Um, they are actually investing in us. Unfortunately, the stories such as Agrisol, Agrica, they're all over the African continent. Uh, many of you who are familiar with the work of the Oakland Institute know of our work in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a country where you can imagine where we talk about <clears throat> famine being blamed onto El Nino. But our research shows that almost 10 to 15 million Ethiopians for the last decade have lived off food aid. So imagine trucks full of food aid coming into the country while trucks full of uh, rice and you know, your or, uh, fair trade flowers leaving the country. This is how the resources of the country are being used. The indigenous, the Anuaks in Gambela have faced a massacre just because the government, the minority that controls the government wants their land so it can be leased out. Lower Omo in Ethiopia, which is UNESCO's World Heritage Site, the place which has the pastoralists, the Bodhis, the Mursis, the uh, Kiras, they've lived there forever, and suddenly they're being forcibly removed because the Indian investors are there putting up the sugarcane plantations, the cotton plantations. And the result of that is not just a way of destruction of life, but we all know the role pastoralists play in places like Ethiopia, in Tanzania, and Kenya. And when they are moved into this small one little acre where they can have no cattle, that is really done only through widespread human rights abuses. Over a year ago, more than a year ago, protests broke out in Ethiopia. And the government itself acknowledges that the way it dealt with the protests, which all had to do with land grabs, the result was over 30,000 people were arrested. Ethiopia is today a country where journalists are either behind bar or they're in exile. Most of political opposition is behind bars. Anyone who tries to defend their right to land, indigenous leaders, land defenders, they're labeled as terrorists. And guess what? Ethiopia is our closest ally in the war on terrorism in that part of the world. We looked the other way. President Obama looked the other way, called a sham of elections as democratic elections. And God forbid, now we have Trump in the White House. What does that mean for the poor, the indigenous, who are then forced to flee, face death in the water as they try to get to European shores, and then they're criminalized? No different as brothers and sisters who are fleeing from different parts of the world come to the United States. South Sudan. Let me give you one little story. Um, we exposed, again, the largest land deal um, in South Sudan. And this one involved a US former, thank you so much, US former ambassador for refugee affairs, Howard Eugene Douglas. He managed to get, he, this was one of the best deals I've ever seen, one million hectares of land for a mere $25,000. One million hectares of land, this is as South Sudan was being born, becoming a country. Uh, this land deal allowed this man for 99 years to cut down any precious forest, teak, wood, anything. He could grow anything he wanted, including genetically engineered crops. He also had the right to whatever was inside the ground. We know about South Sudan and how rich it is, which is almost its problem and the cause of uh, the conflict, that, that civil war that continues. Because the whole thing is who will control it, United States or China? But Howard Eugene Douglas had this great deal. But the beauty of this is that though they say this is for the good of the country, this is for the development, they're providing opportunities, I always think it's like a Dracula. Because the minute you expose it, bring it out into the sunlight, it has no place to hide and it has no place to run. When we first put out the expose on uh, Kenyatta development, which was run by the US ambassador, who, by the way, used to be a CIA operative, we learned that later uh, in Sudan, the people of this village, Mukaya Payam, they marched down to see the president. They could still do that um, a couple of years ago. And they were very clear. 
that when they were fighting for South Sudan, the slogan or the motto that mobilized them was land belongs to community. And when they came out from the bush to find they've been ambushed by the American supporters and politicians and the ambassadors, they were very clear. If anyone touches our land, we'll lynch them. Thankfully, at that time, President Kiir canceled the land deal, and that was another one down. Um, <clears throat> I could continue with so many examples from Papua New Guinea. You know, unlike African countries, this is a country where every farmer at least grows 50 different kinds of vegetables and fruits. This is a country where we all can learn from in terms of how to protect our biodiversity, how to nourish our bodies, how to take care of each other, and how to live in a way which will you know, cool down our planet, as Via Campesina says. But again, in the name of development, when we met with the agriculture minister, he was claiming that we have to change the mindset of people so they stop being so attached to land. Because 94% of the land in Papua New Guinea is, um, is, under common, uh, is in commons, where the communities own it. They're not land titles. So the business of the agriculture ministry was, how do you detach, how do you create this one night stand that we have in this industrial food system that Wendell Berry says? How do we create the same relationship of people with their land and with their food system? Because that would bring development. Last year, we put out a report which clearly showed that one of the largest companies from Malaysia, which says that we are in Papua New Guinea to help them with their taxes and we bring them revenue, we showed that they operate through 20 different subsidiaries. And over the last 20 years, they have not paid a single dime because they report losses each year. Now imagine if you had a business and you made losses for 20 years, you would still be around. The Malaysian companies can because through tax evasion, through all kind of ways, uh, they're able to show losses while they're logging down Papua New Guinea so they can set up, they claim to set up palm oil plantations and they can steal resources of the communities. Our report came out at a great time because at that time Papua New Guinea was faced with a severe financial crisis, the public officials were not being paid, teachers were not being paid, healthcare education budgets were being cut down by over 40 percent. And then people knew where the money is. And to hold these um, you know, in corporations accountable, more important, hold the governments accountable. Uh, we never thought we would see that happen because there's such rampant corruption which is maintained by those who benefit from it. But just last year, towards the end of the year, we got news that over 140,000 hectares of land were given back to the landowners. Just this past week, uh, Supreme Court, the National Court in Papua New Guinea ruled in favor of the landowners and the lands would be released. But just so you know how big the problem is, I'm talking about 100,000, 200,000 hectares of land being returned. Seven million hectares of land deals are illegal in Papua New Guinea, which have been made possible in the name of development. And we need to question when we call Tanzania least developed country, how come destruction, devastation, how come a country like United States is called a developed country? Which civilized country builds wall? Which civilized country first comes and steals from the others and claims it is only mine? How can it be a developed country? And that is what we need to start questioning. You know, under Trump, we have seen the claims and boasting of that we are out of the Paris climate deal. We continue with the theft of resources around the world. We continue to kill communities as our drones are sent out, as more troops are sent to Afghanistan. We continue to ice raid that are taking away and breaking apart families that is taking away hardworking workers, the farm workers, the dairy farm workers, and others who keep this economy and our communities alive. But we also know the power of the people. We all were stumped when Trump came into the White House. I could not believe it when my daughter told me, are they going to send you back, Ma? When my mother called me from India and told me I should stop wearing Indian clothes. When my dear friend, 
who married her partner and, and I was there at the celebration who said, you know, these days we don't hold hands as we walk outside. I was terrified when I saw in Texas that Indian man killed, but I was equally terrified when some of my own family members said, but they don't know we are Indians, they shouldn't have killed us. <laughs> it reminded me of Gandhi saying, don't throw me out of the train because I'm not black, I'm an Indian in South Africa. This struggle is our struggle. What happens in North Dakota is our problem. What's happening with Harvey is happening in Bangladesh. What is happening in Puerto Rico is happening across the world. The good news is we are then the global forces. We are the global forces. You know, very often when I see Monsanto and others and the continuous lying where they say, we will feed the world, we will feed the world, we will feed the world. We all know who feeds the world. When I look at my part of the world, 80% of the food that is consumed in the developing world is not grown by ADM, Cargill, or Monsanto. It is grown by hardworking family farmers, men and women who feed us. If we look at the global picture, including United States and the Western rich countries, who feeds the world? It is not Roundup soya, Roundup corn, Roundup whatever, but it is the food, 70% of it is grown by the small family farmers. People who say the genie is out of the bottle, no it's not, and we can put a very good cork on it. And we have done it. Many years ago when I started work, we used to look up to the European Union. Whoever thought in the United States we would be talking about labeling laws? Whoever thought of that? Whoever thought that Monsanto would have to hide its emails and pay academics to put out these reports? Whoever thought? We made them do that because they're afraid. We are not afraid, but they are very afraid. So given that, I would just say, we have enough examples. You know, a couple of years ago, actually, during the Paris Climate Deal at the Institute, we put out 33 case studies all over Africa, because Africa is such a poster child, that if we really want to increase production, if we really want to deal with the climate crisis, if we really want equity, we know how to do agriculture. We know the science behind it. And it was happening. And these were not some cutesy micro examples. When you add them up, they were impacting lives of millions and millions of people in Africa. So I would end by saying, we know how to feed this world. We know how to clothe everyone. We know how to provide shelter to everyone. But what we have to do now is to get rid of all those people who get in the way of making that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Anurada. So we have, we have time for a couple of questions. I would say let's have five questions to Anurada. We have a microphone over there. And by the way, I forgot to thank not only Christina and Yolanda in the kitchen, but everyone in the kitchen, all the volunteers in registration, all the volunteers interpreting, and also <laughs> Pam and Chris, who have been supporting us the past three years, they are part of the team of Nutiba. And everyone who has been helping us, also donating food, because we have dozens of donors of food to, to cook today. And actually, Theo Ferguson is there, and I want to thank her also, because she's one of the sponsors. So we have time for five questions, please. Este, she's here, and she's amazing. And, I, I, for a long time, I, I really want to bring her back to our conference. She was uh, in 2012. I think we have the justice began with this in San Francisco. Yeah. You were there. So thank you again. So, Theo? Yes, thank you so much for being so clear. What I'm wondering is, how is it that we can weave uh, some thread 
through the Oakland Institute's needle. In other words, how can we communicate maybe some templates, some learnings about your experience so that we have the capacity when we meet it to know how to respond by giving really good examples. You know, in other words, it's, there was a, a really good book about nonprofits. I don't remember, unfortunately, the name of it, but it showed all the things that worked and all the things that didn't work, right? And so I'm wondering whether or not the Institute has thought about putting together some templates of action. And sometimes it might be just, you know, a letter writing campaign. Sometimes it might be, you know, phone bombing, you know, particular people or situations because there are communities, the community in, in Iowa, there are people who know, mm -hmm. who know that man, you know, and, and I'm just thinking that, you know, bit by bit, we need to find ways to not just have the networks, but to have a lot of network flow. So what would you recommend? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, all of our information is, all our reports, everything um, is on our website. Um, we always joke, most of the followers on our Facebook and Twitter are communities in Ethiopia and uh, Papua New Guinea, and uh, so they do get it. But uh, we also work a lot with the students. One thing I didn't mention in the, you know, as we were looking through all these different land grabs, um, we found a lot of the university endowments are invested in private equity funds that are behind these land grabs. Uh, so we had exposed one, which was a UK-based uh, emergent asset management. Of course, it wasn't UK, it was, <clears throat> it was uh, registered in all the tax havens like Mauritius. But uh, Harvard University had put in $500 million, Vanderbilt had put in $30 million. And uh, when the expose came out, we do focus a lot on communication strategies. So when Guardian and other newspapers reported on our findings, it was beautiful to see students at Vanderbilt mobilize, students at Harvard mobilized. Um, Harvard had to pull back its $500 million. And Vanderbilt, which didn't do anything during the apartheid time, it was one of the uh, perhaps a few universities that did not pull out of South Africa, it had to pull out its $30 million from Emergent. So definitely what we look to do is to build relationships. Um, I'll be honest, most times our partners are partners uh, with not even a postal address. Uh, they reach out to us and we try to find different connections. And very often it's right here at home. Um, our, reti our retirement uh, savings, our, um, you know, where they're invested in, our university endowments, our private school endowments where they're invested in. If you're a teacher, you're a nurse, um, if you're in theocraft, these are some of the worst land grabbers because since, I didn't mention, 2007, 2008 was not just the high food uh, price crisis. It was also the financial crisis. So since then, they have been looking at the next soft commodity to invest in. And land is, as some people describe, even better than gold. Because it's not just increasing in value, but you can also make money off it while you own it. So this has driven a lot of private equity funds who couldn't possibly perhaps spell agriculture, who do not know the culture of agriculture, are now in agriculture. I'm wondering if you've done any work with um, public banking, if you're familiar with the benefits to a country um, a university, a county, from that the Public Banking Institute has a lot of information. North Dakota has a public bank, and during the, all the hard times, even during the, the recession in the 30s, there they, farmers would send in, I can't pay, make the payment, and they would just write a note back saying, we'll take, uh, don't make payments until this is over, and we'll get back to you on that. And the public banks are actually beloved by, well, they're appreciated by other banks because they do things like student loans and so on that are not so popular with commercial banks. So they actually have a good working relationship. And when, a, when you have a public bank, it's the state's assets that form the collateral of the bank. And so it's very easy for a state or a county or some you know, entity to do that and to function properly. Thank you. Um, well, in the course of our work, we do push for the rural banks to come back. One of the things that has happened in 
all over Africa, Asia, and elsewhere is to get rid of the banks that would meet the needs of the rural poor. I mean, I am from a country where uh, we all know about the number of farmers who have committed suicide. 75% uh, of their loans were not from the banks because that's considered a bad idea, the public banks. Uh, but instead from, um, uh, you know, these uh, private lenders who basically drive them to a point where they've been forced to commit suicide. But definitely, I think you're somebody we should connect with to learn more about public banking. Thank you. I, I meant, I got nervous. <laughs> I meant to add that when you have a public bank, you're not paying 25 or 30 percent interest to some other bank to finance infrastructure renewal or anything else that a state wants to do for its citizens. Thank you. There is only the one state bank existing now. It came in during the progressive era, era about 100 years ago. But, maybe, but many other people, if you read Ellen Brown's book, Web of Debt, it's, it's discussed in there in a very entertaining way, and so you can find out about it. And like I say, Public Banking Institute will give you much more information. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really inspired. I was uh, inspired to tears by some of these stories that you shared and victories and, and struggles. And I volunteer. I live here in the Bay Area, and I volunteer in a school in East Oakland um, where my son goes. And I'm wondering the interconnectedness of your work and applicability to you know, these children that they don't often uh, relate themselves to being being able to own their property, grow their food. Uh, if you could speak at all to your the, sort of the cross section of where we live with this amazing international work that you're doing, I'd, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, well, you know, I don't know how many of you know that in this country over the next um, 20 years, more than half of the country's farmland will change hands. It is not going to be going back to the farmers. You know, I'm always surprised when you start seeing some of the statistics around farmers in the United States. People will say that the average age of a farmer is 56 years or so. 49 out of the 50 poorest counties in America are rural counties. Uh, most of the family farmers have to get a second, third job to make ends meet. And then the land is changing hands. And it's very interesting that the same actors who have rushed into places like Africa are also rushing to take over land in this country. At the same time, our research shows that there is no shortage of enthusiasm amongst young farmers. What is lacking is the purchasing power if you start looking at the value of land. Um, droughts have proven to be a great time when these vultures are out there buying up land, and we've seen that happen over the last five, six years. In fact, we produced a report called Down on the Farm, which is available on our website, uh, which documents what's happening right here in the United States, this land grab, and who's going to own it. But moving away from that, we all live in the Bay Area. We know what the housing market has happened. Hardworking people, who cannot afford to have a roof over their heads or own a home. Children who are growing up, you know, my daughter goes to a school where we know that some children live in cars and they come to school because they're homeless. So the idea of having some land to be able to grow food, to know that tomatoes actually don't come out of a can that you buy in some shop, dollar store, but they actually grow on plants, you know, if you start thinking about that, you know, in my work as I travel and I meet with communities and I spend time with them, the children of the Maasai or the children that I've met have a far closer relationship with land than we have right here in the Bay Area. And there's something very wrong with that. There's something very criminal as you drive up here and you see tent after tent after tent coming up. These are not a fad thing. These are families very often that are living right here. And every time I think, you know, I'm still trying to figure out after all these years in America, I mean, if I'm an American or I'm an Indian, and you want to kind of say I'm from India, but you keep wondering, how do you say we are going to make America great while the future is so bleak, while the future 
is so dismal when we think of the children and, 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 and what we are raising them with. When we look at this, the situation of schooling, when you look at the Oakland schools or the schools in Fruitvale, the prison pipeline, everything that we have, how, how are we going to make this country great? Can, can we have the next two questions uh, very concise, very direct, you know? Uh, so not... And I'll try to be focused as well. Sorry, okay, Miguel. Thank you. So okay, my question is uh, about in Sri Lankan context. So youth doesn't interest in agriculture. So the, our problem is we have enough land, agricultural land came from their parents, but youth doesn't interest in agriculture involving with their, with, their, with their activities with their parents, they have done for a longer time. So it became a problem to give lands to bigger companies or bigger people to use as productive lands. Do you have any experience how to interact with youth and any other related to your experience? Well, I think the best way to do and what we found is when you have dignity, it is shameful that people who grow our food, the labor that it takes to put food on the table, to cook a wonderful meal that sustains us, that takes care of the environment, that maintains a biodiversity, the dignity has been taken away from it. The rights of the farmers have been taken away. It has become a profession where you might see your father committing suicide. It does become a big challenge then to tell the young people that this is what you should be doing. And that is why, first of all, we have to start with human rights and dignity of farming. We have to recognize the role that farmers, small family farmers, the fisher folk play, not just in producing food, but in nurturing this whole planet. You know, I remember my country when it gained independence, the slogan used to be Jai Jawan Jai Kisan, which means, you know, salute to the soldier and salute to the farmer, because we recognize at the time of independence to maintain your independence, you need real security, and food security was very important. But in this whole new development paradigm, where you don't have to worry about protecting the livelihoods of farmers, when you don't need to have public distribution systems to maintain food security of the poor, when you don't need to have floor pricing, that never mind what happens with the market, the farmers will at least be ensured of a decent livelihood. We got rid of all of that. So I think instead of just lecturing the young people that you should stay being a farmer, what we have to do, and that is a national and a global struggle, that needs to be. You know, I'm shocked. Every time I go to my daughter's school, I'm told, we are preparing people who can work at Google. Last time I checked, yes, I can do a lot of good search on Google. It does not feed me. It does not feed my daughter. It does not take care of the climate change. It doesn't do any of that. So that whole mindset that everyone will work at Google, everyone will come up with a new app so we can afford to live in San Francisco, we have to dismantle. We have to stand up and talk about what development really means. It means respect for each other. It means respect for our children. It means respecting our bodies that what goes inside is sacred and not the poison that is put inside us. That's what it means. You know, I, I know Vandana was here. She's my teacher. I was in first year of college in Delhi University when she drove me up to Garhwal and left me there. My job as an intern was to carry the bicycle for Sundarlal Bahugana, the founder of the Chipko movement. So we would travel from village to village, and I would be carrying the bioscope. Bioscope is, you know, where you ratchet it up, and then they show these black and white uh, documentaries about what's happening. Uh, that's how old I am. Uh, so that was my job. I would be carrying that around. And I got to know the villagers really well. So we started eating together, and they would cook me this dal and chawal. And I was there with a few other people, students from Delhi, and we said, let, let, we'll cook for you. We had brought some Maggi noodles, and I'll never forget we made these Maggi noodles. And Sundarlal Bhaguna looked at me and looked at these other people who were with me. I was the only girl, and he said, 
is this what you're all eating in Delhi these days? <laughs> what is development? When we destroy a beautiful piece of land, when we call, and I'll challenge some of you because we say soil, not oil. Soil, what does it mean? It comes from the word soiled, dirty, dirt. We're talking about the earth, which in most cultures, indigenous cultures, is Mother Earth. We have to change our relationship with Mother Earth to actually know how we should talk about development. Displacing people, destroying livelihoods, destroying families is not development. I again rambled on, sorry, Miguel. Do we have time for one more or? Uh, well, I don't know if somebody else has a question. We have just time for one more. And I'm going to tell you before that we have to be out at 8. It's like 10 minutes from now. Please, if you are not coming back tomorrow, please take your programs to the table so other people can reuse it tomorrow and take pumpkins to your house if you are not coming back tomorrow. But I hope you, to see you tomorrow. It's going to be a, a, amazing, the program again. Um, there is an international organization that addresses most of what you're talking about. Uh, and they changed it from food security to food sovereignty. La Via Campesina is an international organization. It's farmers who not only run their own farms, but also distribute their own distribution and control the markets. In the old world, this is in a new world, it's called socialism. There's another country that has a, a, a program that protects the farmer and protects the land. And it's a small country called Cuba. And if somebody had some energy, maybe you should put a little group of people to go down to Cuba and tell them, you should be leading the sovereignty movement with La Via Campesina, and then we'd have an international program. Would you like to comment on that one? Thank you. I think that's a great way to conclude this evening. La Via Campesina, which is the organization, the largest organization of small family farmers from around the world, that actually put the whole concept of food sovereignty on the map. This is not about food security. Uh, but really the farmer's right to be able to grow food as they want, choose what they want. So this is a sovereign principle of sovereignty and not just security as defined by the World Bank and aid agencies. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Miguel, and all of you wonderful folks. Thank you so much, Anuradha. Please stay. How many of you are coming back tomorrow? How many of you are coming back tomorrow? Excuse me. Okay, those who are not coming back tomorrow, please take some squash to your house. If you are coming back tomorrow, please, please take some squash and, este, and help us bring back the programs if you are not coming back tomorrow to the front desk. And we have to be outside in five minutes. I'm sorry that I am este, telling you that, but we have to be out, outside in, in five minutes, outside of the building. <laughs>